Okay, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, um, and welcome to the final webinar in our Service Innovation Series. We're delighted to introduce Professor Andy Neely from the Cambridge Service Alliance as our guest speaker for today's session. Andy is a founding member of the Cambridge Service Alliance, which is a unique global partnership between businesses and universities. They're devoted to delivering the tools and insights needed for complex service solutions, and Andy will touch on the um, work that the, the, the Alliance does um, in his presentation. Uh, Andy is widely recognized for his work on servitization and manufacturing and has authored over 100 books and articles. So I'm, I'm really excited about today's session. I think we're in for a really uh, fascinating 45 minutes or so. Um, before we begin, just a few things to mention. Uh, the session is being recorded and will be sent out in the next two to three days. We would also like the session to be as interactive as possible, so please post your questions in the chat box throughout. Uh, and we'll, we'll spend the final sort of 10, 15 minutes or so going through them. So without further ado, I'll pass you over to Andy. Thanks, Chris. Um, and I'm just put it onto PowerPoint mode. So um, I am delighted to be here. It's, it's great to participate in this webinar. Uh, very happy to uh, have a, a bit of a discussion on this topic around um, making the shift to services. I put services and solutions in the title uh, for some reasons I'll come back to uh, and talk a bit about some of the critical success factors as we see them. So as Chris says, I'm based at the University of Cambridge and I run something called the Cambridge Service Alliance here, which is part of the engineering department. We work very closely with a number of large uh, organizations, so Caterpillar, BA Systems, IBM, uh, Rolls-Royce, uh, Pearson, um, all interested in making this shift to services. Uh, and what I thought I'd do this afternoon is talk a little bit about what's happening in industry and the, the general shift to services, uh, and then talk particularly about a project we've been doing recently trying to understand what are the critical success factors to get this uh, journey right in organization. So if I just paint the context and explain a bit about the organizations that uh, we've been working with, uh, start with BAE Systems. So many of you will know BAE Systems, large defense company, uh, very, um, uh, very involved in services. Over half of its revenue comes from support solutions now. Uh, major reason for that actually is BAE Systems' is customers or customer. So if you think about the defense industry, typically firms have one customer per country. Um, so the MOD in the UK, the Department of Defense in the US. Um, BAE Systems operate in a world where their customer came to them uh, about 10, 15 years ago now and said, we don't want to buy your products. Uh, we're much, much more interested in contracting for capability. Uh, we're interested in working with you over the long term so you provide um, services and solutions that, that meet our needs. So if you take the air domain, they have a contract for, get, for providing a guaranteed number of trained pilots per year. So as well as providing the aircraft, they, they provide all the training for the pilots. Uh, in the naval domain, uh, they have a guaranteed availability contract for uh, warships. So as part of that contract, the A systems have to guarantee a certain number of, of days availability of ships per year. Uh, and interestingly, in that contract, if you take Portsmouth uh, down on the Portsmouth Naval Base, as well as supporting the ships, um, the MOD has also said to BAE, we'd like you to run the entire Naval Base for us. So we'd like you to uh, look after the facilities, manage the catering for sailors, uh, manage the inventory levels, uh, manage the road estate, and so on. Uh, and of course, BAE doesn't want to do all of that themselves. They outsource some of that work to third parties. So Aramark does the catering, uh, Babcock has the uh, facilities management contract, but those organizations have to work together to make sure the naval base operates in a way to ensure that the outcome the Navy wants, the availability of ships, is delivered. So quite a different world from one where you're just making products inside your uh, walls of your factory. Um, different model, but um, another organization involved in this general shift of services, Caterpillar. So in the construction or the mining industry, um, key driver there is really the, um, the ongoing 
uh, lifetime revenue that comes from parts and consumables. So if you take um, construction equipment, you know, if you sell a, a, a truck for a million dollars, let's say, the parts and consumables are about four million dollars on that truck across the course of its life. And the margin on those is about 10 times the margin on the original truck. So selling the, uh, the truck matters, but in many ways, much, much more important is how do I keep the relationship with the customer for the next 30 years so that they continue to come back to me to buy the parts and consumables and ask me to service and support their truck. So Caterpillar's uh, doing some really interesting things. They, they have a model where they go to market through dealers, a very close relationship with the dealers. Uh, the whole telematics area, the amount of data that's coming back off trucks allows you to remotely monitor the health of the asset, so you can make predictions about uh, when it's likely to break down. Uh, you can also use the data that's coming off that asset to optimize um, the operations of your customer. So if you think about a quarry, uh, actually people running quarries want uh, not just the ability to make sure the truck works, but they want to minimize the cost per ton of earth extracted or uh, minerals extracted. Well, if you've got GPS position on your truck and you've got scales which weigh the amount of material in the bed of the truck, you know when the truck is full of material because the scales tell you it's at 100 tons and therefore it's full. Um, you know the GPS position and if you've filled the truck but then it hasn't moved straight away and it waits for 30 seconds, that's 30 seconds lost production time. And in a quarry, that's a big deal. So by using the data that's coming off the asset, Caterpillar is not only able to monitor the asset, but also able to provide advice to the customer about how you might uh, avoid losing production time, so maximize productivity of the quarry. And so they build a deeper uh, relationship with the customer. And then a completely different um, example, uh, so not just heavy assets, but Pearson. So Pearson is um, an education, well, many people think of Pearson as a publisher. Um, of course, the future for them doesn't lie in printed books. Uh, so increasingly, edu uh, Pearson is reinventing itself as an education solutions provider. Um, so online learning, uh, online testing materials, um, they, again, interesting use of data here. So if you imagine students doing um, homework on an iPad, well, one of the consequences of that, of course, is that the teacher could remotely monitor how long students spend on their homework uh, and therefore get some insight into the level of engagement students have got with, with, with that particular piece of work. So if somebody spends 10 minutes at home, they're either finding the homework incredibly easy or they're not really engaging with that uh, piece of work. In either case, useful information for the teachers know. And if you've got a class of 35 kids and you know these 32 are spending a normal amount of time on their homework, but those three are spending either far too long or, or a really short period of time, you can then go and spend time with those three individuals and direct your limited resource as a teacher, your time and attention, to help those three either master the material or re-engage in it because the others are getting on fine at this point in time. And of course, that information would change uh, across the course of the year with different children. So potentially the data gives teachers a, a different way of managing their interactions with classes. And Pearson's trying to develop those uh, online learning, online testing, online support materials. You step back from that, you say, well, what's really happening? And it seems to us in Cambridge that there are sort of five big shifts that are going on. So the first is this um, shift from a world uh, of products to a world in, including solutions. The wording is very deliberate here. So we're not saying products are going away. They still absolutely matter. But there's more focus as well on the solution. So what is it that the product actually allows me to do? That's accompanied by a shift from we would often talk about outputs to outcomes. So rather than just focusing on the thing you produce, uh, go back to the BAE systems example, uh, the outcome we want is a guaranteed availability of ships for a certain number of days per year or a certain number of pilots trained or a cost per tonne of earth extracted or students to pass their exams to become college ready. So people are thinking much more about how do we design systems that deliver outcomes uh, rather than just producing output. Consequence of that, I think, is that often you end up with quite deep uh, relationships. So rather than it being just a transaction where you go and buy something and step away, uh, increasingly in the world of services and solutions, 
you have long-term relationships between the provider and the customer. So BAE Systems is on its third five-year contract with the MOD running the Portsmouth, Portsmouth Naval Base. And clearly, if you're, you know, if you're when working together for 15 years, you form deep relationships, you know the customer well, they know you well, you're more willing potentially to invest for the long term, so you might buy that extra crane and install it because you know in the long term you'll get a decent uh, return on that investment. So it's a, a very different relationship between provider and customer. A fourth shift we see is, is from suppliers to network partners. And so we think about this in terms of organizations pooling their capability. So again, go back to the Portsmouth example. In Portsmouth, it's not just that BAE systems deliver the outcomes, but they're working with Aramark, they're working with Babcock, and it's those different partners, uh, each bringing different capability and saying, as a network, we'll pool our capability to deliver the outcome the customer wants. So you end up with much more complex organizational relationships. Interestingly, in the BAE case, um, so Babcock collaborates with BAE on the Portsmouth Naval Base, but a bit down the road, um, different base, they compete. So you end up with very um, complex and quite sophisticated inter-organizational relationships in this world of uh, services and solutions. And then the final shift we see is, is this one from uh, elements to ecosystems. So what we're really talking about there is, if you think of elements as individual organizations, Increasingly, the way that you need to think about competition is at the level of the ecosystem and how do I configure the right uh, network of organizations together to pool our capability to deliver the outcome in a way that is more effective for the customer than the competing ecosystem might. So an interesting um, illustration of this, one of my favorite examples, was that there was a lovely, um, well, if you think about Uber as an example, um, Uber has done a fantastic job of building a platform, a digital platform. Uh, it's co-opted people who own cars and said, join our digital platform, bring your cars to the digital platform, um, and we will connect drivers uh, with people, passengers, uh, who want a, a ride in a car. Uber provides the trust mechanism, so they give you an opportunity as a passenger to rate the driver, the driver to rate the passenger. They provide the payment mechanism, so they store your credit card details. You don't pay the driver in cash. The money's automatically uh, taken from your credit card. And then Uber, in turn, pays the driver and retains a percentage, uh, and that's how Uber makes its money. But if you think about the ecosystem Uber's built, it's built that digital platform to allow you to then bring together drivers and customers in a really seamless way as a customer. So it's a remarkably efficient process. If you have the app on your phone, you know, a couple of clicks and you've ordered the car, you know when it's going to turn up, you know what the reg is, um, you know the estimated time of arrival at your location and at destination using GPS maps and so on. So it's a very seamless process. Uh, and there are lots of similar examples where people are thinking about how do I build the ecosystem to allow me to deliver the outcome uh, the customer wants. So um, one of the things that we've been looking at over the years is saying, well, this, uh, one level of the shift to service and solutions is not new. You know, people have been talking about the need to, to think about services and solutions for, uh, for, for a long time, particularly in the capital equipment type markets. Um, We've been sort of, but actually organizations seem to find making this transition quite difficult and quite long, um, uh, take place over a long time scale. So uh, we were then trying to understand, well, what are some of the critical success factors that allow you to successfully make the transformation to services? And so the study that uh, we talked to, I'm going to talk about now is, is one where we uh, worked with Zoetis, uh, Gear, and Pearson. So Zoetis, uh, was part of Pfizer, uh, animal health business, um, separate company now. So basically, Zoetis make vaccines for uh, animals, so both farm animals, cows and pigs and sheep and so on, but also what they call companion animals, so um, cats and uh, dogs. They, like many pharmaceutical firms, uh, have a direct relationship with the prescriber of their product, so in Zoetis's case, the vet. Um, but not necessarily a direct relationship with the consumer. Um, 
in, in that case, the animal, or indeed the owner of the animal, so the farmer and the, um, and the owner of the pet. Uh, and so Zoetis were interested in services as a way of, A, helping their um, prescribers do a better job, run their veterinary practices more efficiently, uh, but B, as a way of getting a closer connection between Zoetis and the end user of their product, um, so the owner of the animal particularly. Uh, the second company, GEAR, GEAR is uh, one of the world's largest, in fact, the world's largest manufacturer of food processing equipment. So they make uh, machines that basically make, uh, they go in the factories and make the food that we eat, so um, chicken and uh, uh, chicken nuggets, or a whole variety of things. And they, um, so for them, services are important because they're providing capital equipment, but a bit like Caterpillar, they make their money on parts and consumables and maintenance of equipment. Increasingly in their industry, their customers are saying, actually, we don't just want you to make the machines for us, and we don't just want you to maintain them, but we would like you to guarantee um, uptime of the machine. Um, so we want you to take the contract where you will uh, ensure that the machine operates seven days a week. Um, and so they're getting into services partly from a sort of customer uh, pool perspective. And then Pearson, I've mentioned already. So for Pearson, a part of the issue there is uh, the printed book. Uh, core business is decreasing. Challenge for Pearson is how quickly the printed book market does decrease, and how quickly Pearson wants to push that along. So if you if you push it along too quickly, when people still want printed books, you're clearly leaving money on the table. If you do it too slowly, you don't adapt quickly enough then uh, people will, other people will come into the market and make that switch. So there's a really delicate balance about the speed and pace of change in an organization like Pearson moving from the printed to the digital um, asset. So there were three quite diverse organizations. In each case, making the shift of services, and in each case, we were saying, well, let's understand the, the transformation they've been on and what's allowed this to be successful. Um, and so, uh, apologies, this is a busy slide, but I'll, I'll explain it um, uh, as we go. Uh, so there are 12 sort of steps that we saw in the service transformation journey, um, numbered 1 to 12, so the, the blue text at the left. So learning platform, uh, being clear about the vision for the future, uh, corporate strategy, and so on. And then inside each of those steps are specific um, sub-steps or activities that were being undertaken. So in the burning platform, people would talk about establishing the urgency of the situation, establishing the business case of what would matter for services, um, creating awareness, a kind of appetite for change. And so the, the way that we came up with this set of steps was really looking at the journeys that uh, Pearson, Zoetis, and Gear had been on and saying, well, let's think about what are the activities they've, they've undertaken. And so if you look at the Zoetis journey, um, actually they didn't start with a burning platform. It, it wasn't that uh, Zoetis were in trouble particularly. Instead, they started with the vision for uh, services. So they were interested, hence the, the number one um, by S4, uh, they were interested in, actually, let's create a vision for solution selling, let's make this a global vision, um, and let's put the uh, investment, the leadership team in place to allow this to happen, because we want to build a closer relationship with the customer. They then went on to think about resources. So they're um, down at the bottom, uh, number four, uh, they're empowering people in a very decentralized way to uh, get on with uh, making this happen. They then thought about leadership, and so um, putting the right exploration team in place to look for new services and so on. I'm, I'm not going to talk through the whole list, but you can see that the journey that um, uh, Zoetis went on. Contrast that with Gear's journey, um, and again, gear didn't start with a burning platform. Actually, it was more of a strategic issue for them. And they said, well, we need to start across our different lines of business to get a more common definition of what services mean so that we can start selling solutions. Uh, and so that led to them defining services as part of the corporate strategy um, and indeed uh, creating the right leadership team uh, inside the organization. Um, so they had a slightly different journey. Uh, and then Pearson, again, a, a, another uh, different journey across these 12 steps. So Pearson, they were more in the burning platform. Current market is 
uh, not going to last forever. So what do we do about the current uh, market? And how do we uh, think about this shift to digital? What does it mean for the organization? Uh, having done that, they then start to think about, well, how do we now put the leadership in place to make this transformation and get a, the right team in place to make the shift to services? Um, then how do we put the right resources in place? So number five. Uh, then they flipped over to the exploration exploitation. So how do we actually manage the design of business where we can both exploit our current assets, i.e. continue to produce and sell books, but explore the future, uh, look at the digital world, and do so simultaneously. And so a slightly different uh, journey for Pearson. So one way of looking at their, their service journeys is this 12-step uh, model. Um, if you, again, if you step back from that and say, well, what's 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 happening here and what do we think the sort of more general uh, story is, then this leads to this um, service strategy model. So it seems to us that actually it's not, although lots of people talk about the need for a burning platform, in the services world, the starting point is not a burning platform always. Um, actually, the starting point should be about assessing uh, both the market and the internal readiness. So how ready is the market for you to make the shift of services, and how ready is your own organization? I'm going to come back to this uh, point in a second. Having done that, there's then a, a series of activities around creating the right strategic and cultural uh, context. So what's the vision for services? Uh, how do you engage your partners and develop that, that customer mindset, that attitude inside the organization? Uh, and how do you develop a service culture? Particularly important when you come from a really strong uh, engineering and technology background. There are then four sort of sets of activities, if you like, internal working that we're doing simultaneously. So internal working are things like the structures and governance, so the leadership team, the organization structure, you're going to have a separate business unit for services, are you going to integrate it into existing business units? Um, there's some stuff around the service processes, so how do you design services, how do you manage the portfolio of services, how do you pilot them, and so on. Uh, there's something about the resources that are needed. How do you make sure that the right resources are in place, both at a company and then, if you like, an individual skills and capability level? And then there's something about building engagement and trust. How do you, particularly when you think about the ecosystem, how do you engage the right partners and how do you engage or co-opt your, your customers into delivering this service? And then the, the final bit is uh, that actually this is a... Um, inevitably in services, you have to continually innovate uh, what you're doing. We, we wrote an article recently called Innovating Backwards, where we argued that actually in services, um, innovation often takes place in parallel with delivery of the service. So unlike a classic product organization where you do R&D, then you launch the product, in a services or solutions context, often you launch your solution and you learn with the customer uh, how to perfect or improve that solution, and then you replicate that in other cases. So um, how do I optimize uh, and communicate my service delivery? And all of that clearly has to take place in, in a sort of change program inside the organization. So rather than that 12-step that model previously and the, the sort of almost random walk through the steps, we think this is a better way of looking at the overall uh, transformation that needs to take place inside organizations. So then inside that, you say, well, so what does that mean in terms of these critical success factors? And, and we identified uh, seven uh, different critical success, success factors. Um, and I'm going to talk through uh, each of these in turn and just expand a little bit on, on what we mean by them. So the first one, that the notion of assessing market and internal readiness. Uh, what's happening here is we're really thinking about um, the, 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 the shift to services um, requires both your own organization and your customer's organization uh, to transform and change in some way. Um, and often that requires the customer, particularly in a solutions context, the customer to relinquish control over certain parts of their operation. So go back to the BA systems example. You know, if I'm going to run the naval base in Portsmouth, um, and I'm going to take a, I'm going to have a contract for being responsible for maintaining uh, ships, then one of the things that I need responsibility for or control over is the spare parts inventory, because I have to make sure the right material is in stock. 
Um, and if I don't have control over it, I need somebody doing that job who's going to work very closely with me to make sure the right materials are in stock. So you, you end up um, in, in often these transformation journeys where you get part control over the processes that you need control over, but not entire control over them. And the reason you don't get entire control over them is because your customer is not yet mentally ready to uh, really make that shift to services. So there was a, a, a very good example of this in, in one particular organization, I won't mention which one. Uh, this was a, uh, a new so solution they were offering. They agreed the solution, which could have driven fantastic efficiencies across this organization. They agreed it in a high-level series of discussions at um, sea level between the two organizations. But the organization that needed to be transformed, or that was to be transformed, had a very devolved uh, management structure. A lot of autonomy for decisions lay with local managers, and they had local budgetary control. And so although there were all sorts of things that you could see could be done in terms of making the local processes more efficient, when, you, when the organization, the providing organization, came in to try and make that transformation, one of the bits of pushback they got from the local level managers in the organization they were transforming was, no, you're not touching my bit of the organization, uh, leave me alone. And so you couldn't deliver the efficiency savings that had been predicted at the outset. So getting, getting it, understanding uh, whether your customer is ready to make this transformation is just as crucial as that you as an organization are ready to make the transformation. Um, and so we think that the things that, that drive that success are, first of all, thinking about what the service value proposition is making sure that you can articulate that in a way that makes sense to people inside your organization, the providing firm, as well as in the customer's uh, organization. Um, then couching that as a compelling business case, so, so making sure that it's clear to the customer how your proposed solution will help them do a better job. So go back to Caterpillar and Quarries. Um, actually, you've got to convince the customer that you can help them optimize production of the quarry and minimize costs per ton of mineral extracted. Um, and you've got to be able to explain to them your capability to do that. Uh, running a, a prototype or a pilot to evaluate uh, the, the appeal of the value proposition, the effectiveness of the business case, and the readiness of the customer uh, and of your organization and your ecosystem partners to deliver the services, the third thing. So not just leaping straight in there, but actually piloting this, partly because you will learn through the pilot. Uh, and that's really the evaluating the pilot and saying, actually, what more could we do to make sure that our solution creates more value for the customer, or indeed for the customer's customer, than previous solutions? So the first thing is this really understanding about internal and market readiness. The second um, CSF is about creating the right strategic and cultural context. So if you're in a situation where uh, people go, yep, we're ready to make this transformation, and our customers are ready to accept that, um, then um, actually how do you um, get people in that mindset? How do you get them to get, adopt a much more service-focused view of the world? How do you create that culture, uh, that customer mindset, if you like? Very challenging often in large um, uh, engineering and technology firms. So, you know, if you, if you, uh, if you cut many people in Caterpillar in half, uh, they would bleed yellow. They love their big yellow machines. Many people in BA systems love their uh, complex bits of equipment. But actually, the customer's not buying necessarily just the big yellow machine. They're buying the outcome that you've got to deliver. So how do you get that balance right between the technical ex excellence but also the... Uh, the customer orientation. Um, and that we've seen often there, people have put a lot of time and effort into creating the, the compelling story uh, which persuades people about the value of services. So IBM, uh, one of our other partners, uh, talked all about the, the smarter planet at one stage. And the smarter planet was the, world, the idea that the world was becoming more instrumented, interconnected intelligence. So more and more devices gathering more and more data, those connected to the net, so data getting sucked back. Uh, and if you use that data sensitively, you can make smarter, more intelligent decisions. That storyline captured people's attention inside IBM, and people could 
understand the transformation that they were trying to make. So you end up with this right strategic uh, and cultural context. And so for us there, the, the sort of steps in doing this or the actions to drive success, partly about creating that clear and compelling service vision, so where are you going, um, partly about ensuring that people across the ecosystem understand and believe in that vision, uh, and so they can start to live that service culture. Um, making sure that people are focused very much on the end customer. So it's not necessarily your direct customer. It may be their customer that you need to think about. How do I create value for them? Um, and also, and this links back to the readiness point, ensuring that your customers are ready, mentally prepared to consume your services. So they've understood your service vision uh, and the customers bought into it as well. The third um, CSF, once you've got the check the readiness, and you said, yes, both parties, provider and customer are ready, and we've got the right strategic and cultural context. The third thing, then, is to think about the structures and governance for services. Um, and so this is really thinking about how do we signal to people uh, that we're serious about services? So you get into the debate about do we want a separate business unit for services? If so, is it a profit center in its own right? If so, how do I avoid the services business competing with the product business, lots of concern in many organizations that if we get really good at services and solutions and extend the life of a product, useful operating life, you reduce the opportunity for new product sales, are you cannibalizing your own product sales, and so the product part of the business and the service part of the business end up um, arguing with one another. There are other examples where people have been very successful at saying, well, actually, the service part of the business is often closer to the customer, understands what the current challenges are of the customer, and can identify new product opportunities. So maybe the service part of the business is uh, more, um, it can, can help the product part of the business grow if you get the right structures uh, in place. So here, this is about governance, it's about service leadership, it's about giving people the right um, hierarchical position, authority, and so on, uh, to grow the services revenue. Um, it's about being clear in terms of your strategic objectives for services um, and therefore what are the target metrics um, for the organization and how they align with incentives. Um, it's about making sure those incentives are aligned across the business unit. So it's not just the service business, but actually you've got to think about how do I get the product and the service part of the business to work together? How do I get R&D to design products that are easy to serve? All of those kinds of questions. Uh, and then recognizing that if you've got a range of different services, you might need different contracting and governance structures. So if I've got some services that are around parts availability and I've got others that are around solutions and outcome selling, that's quite different skills and capabilities and I might need different uh, structures. The fourth uh, CAF, CSF, and many ways three, four, five, and six to that sort of middle bubble in the picture that I showed before, so these go in parallel, but the, the fourth one is around delivering or dedicating the resources for service innovation and delivery. Um, and so uh, actually making sure that the services are not seen as a poor cousin in the organization, but get their fair set share of support uh, is, is crucial to, to help grow the, uh, the services business. And here, being clear about what you're going to do and what your partners in the ecosystem are going to do is also crucial. So thinking about what are the great capabilities we've got, but who do we need to partner with elsewhere to bring or pool capability to deliver a good service? And so this is all about understanding uh, what resources and capabilities are required to deliver the service, uh, what resources and capabilities you have and which exist in the broader ecosystem, uh, using that mapping, if you like, to understand where the resource and capability gaps might lie, uh, and then thinking about, well, how do I finance, how do I budget to grow those um, uh, capabilities and to get the right investments, both for today and tomorrow. So this is a long-term gain in terms of making uh, the shift to services. The fifth um, CSF is about then managing engagement and trust. And this is both internal uh, within the provider organization uh, external, so with the customer, but also in that wider uh, ecosystem. Um, and so increasingly people talk about, with customers, uh, you know, people talk a lot about the experience economy and the fact that we can view services 
uh, you can view processes in organizations as a kind of left to right activity, um, you know, almost transactional. I greet somebody at the entrance to the restaurant, I take them to their seat, I give them a menu, I sit them down, they choose their food, we serve their food, and so on, a series of steps. You can also view it as, a, as, a, as an emotional experience for the customer. So what does somebody feel when they walk into your restaurant? Uh, if someone greets you in a friendly way, how does that make them feel? If, the, if it's a family having a birthday party, what do you do that's special for that family to make them feel that they're being looked after? That's a business to consumer example, clearly. But the same thing is true in business to business. One of the um, firms that we work quite closely with, one of their clients one day, and they were saying they just refurbished the reception. And we uh, walked in, fantastic refurbishment this reception. Uh, and I was commenting on it and saying, it looks wonderful, but it also says to you, this is going to be expensive. Uh, and the reaction of the people there was, that's absolutely right. Many of our customers don't like coming into this reception. They prefer to go in the back door because they feel a bit out of place in this sort of shiny new reception. So your, the, the emotional response you get and then the trust that, that creating that right emotional response in your customer's mind uh, really matters. Um, so thinking about, uh, I think that phrase of walking the service journey with your customer is really important. You know, just trying to put your customer's eyes on and say, what's this experience like for the customer, and how does that make them feel, and do they want to uh, work with us? Um, so the, the success factors here around uh, how do you engage customers, um, how do you uh, get the channels to get the information back uh, from customers? Uh, how do you uh, make sure that actions uh, on that customer feedback improve the quality of the processes you've got uh, and that you learn from the customer? So some of the, the most successful uh, solution selling firms that we work with talk about having paternalistic customers. So these are customers they're very close to. They will often come to this the organization and say, we would like you to provide, develop a solution to do X, and we will work with you. We'll, we'll fund that development work. We know you're doing development work to develop this solution, but we think it would be good for you to, to develop this, and we think there'd be demand for it. We would like it, and we're sure others would like it as well. So the paternalistic customer is almost pulling the provider along and saying, this is how you can do a better job for us. So how do you um, uh, co-opt your uh, paternalistic customer? Um, and then constantly just gauging that opportunity gap between what the customer, the outcome they're really looking for, and the services uh, that you're providing. The sixth um, CSF then is about how you, you develop and embed service processes. So many product organizations have very good uh, product processes. So we have product design, we have uh, planning processes, pricing, et cetera, et cetera. But actually, uh, service processes are slightly different. So we need to think about, and we, we talked about five key service processes. So uh, what's, how do you design and develop a service operating model? Um, how do you manage the portfolio of services? How do you kill services when they're no longer uh, useful? How do you pilot um, um, and simulate uh, test service offerings? How do you scale services? So there are lots of examples where people are able to deliver a service with one customer but find it really difficult to scale that and deliver it with multiple customers. How do you do that? Um, and how do you innovate from uh, what we'd often call generation one to generation two services? So you might start by guaranteeing availability of equipment, but then as you move to an outcome-based contract, uh, how do you make that uh, transition? Uh, and so here, the, the actions that really drive success are around thinking about your service operating model, um, defining the rules for service portfolios, uh, including this question of how do you terminate um, a service that's not worked? Um, how do you gauge the success of services um, as, you, as you seek to scale them and as you uh, gather feedback from people? Um, and then how do you get these processes for commercializing, upgrading services? And then the final uh, CSF is saying this is not a one-off activity, but actually you're constantly innovating, uh, optimizing, and trying to improve the way that you are uh, running your services business. So uh, how building that capability to innovate continuously and learn how to better deliver the services in the future. Um, 
And uh, this, all well, this is about identifying and codifying uh, good service practices, uh, sharing uh, information, uh, disseminating good practices, particularly in big global businesses. You know, I might may, may find a great solution being developed in one geographic location. How do I capture that and then get it replicated in other locations around the world? So people talked about services repositories, that almost like guidebooks of how you know, we might deliver services. Um, and deliberately searching and looking for those service innovations and challenging uh, the status quo, if you like, across the organization. So uh, if I go back to this original framework, as you can tell, those seven critical success factors really map onto the, the bubbles in this particular framework. And I think the, just in terms of closing, the, the key points for me in the framework here are thinking about um, the questions of uh, readiness, saying it's not about a burning platform, it's actually about understanding are we ready as a provider and are our customers ready for us to make this transformation to solutions services? How we create the right strategic and cultural context, get the right mindset, be clear about the service vision, articulate that story of where we're going. Then think about the internal working, so the governance, the structures, the processes, the resources, and that crucial piece around engagement and trust. And then finally, thinking about, you know, we don't get this right on day one, we're constantly innovating the service, how do we optimize and improve uh, the quality of service? And so as we looked at the, the firms that had made good progress on making the shift to services solutions, those were really the elements that we saw. And they thought, um, often they hadn't thought about all of these things at the outset. So generally, reps into this particular framework and these CSSs, if we'd known that at the start, it would have been really helpful because you learn some lessons on the way as you're, as you're developing services. So this is really an attempt to kind of lay out a roadmap and say if you're, if you're either making the transition to services or you are, um, you know, you're midway through it and you're thinking about where next or you're thinking about getting into this, these are some of the elements uh, that you should think about. Um, so I hope that's uh, helpful. I hope that makes sense. And I'm very happy to uh, answer any questions that people have got. If you'd like more detail on this uh, particular piece of work, I've just put on the, uh, the final slide here um, a copy of the uh, executive briefing that we've got on this particular subject called Seven Critical Success Factors in the Shift of Services, and that's available at the, the Cambridge Service Alliance uh, website, um, and there are some hyperlinks here that people can access uh, later on. Uh, so thank you very much for your time, and I'm very happy to, to take questions from people I'll put the screen back to the, the chat mode so if people type in questions, we can uh, see them there. Perfect. Thanks, Andy. Um, so if we just go back to the, uh, the main deck. Um, yeah, so as Andy said, if you, if you want to post some, uh, some questions in the chat box, we'll, we'll, we'll spend the next sort of 10 minutes going through those. Um, just to kind of kick start uh, the Q&A session, and so at the start of the, the, start of the presentation, you, you mentioned uh, the main drivers to, to servitization. Um, I think you touched on BAE systems. It, with them, it was kind of customer demands driving that shift. Um, is that the main reason you see why companies uh, are changing towards this servitization approach, or what are the drivers um, are you seeing with some of the companies you work with? So I think there's I mean, this is a good question, Chris. I think there are different drivers, it seems to me. So um, I, I often talk about these in sort of three categories, so strategic, um, uh, economic, and environmental. So um, start with the economic ones. So in some cases, it is uh, a recognition that says that actually we cannot compete in manufacturing always on um, the, the uh, cost of uh, it, so we can't compete on low cost, uh, particularly in developed economies. We need to compete on innovation. Services are one way of innovating. So it's a kind of competitive economic argument. Uh, the install base is another big argument. So for some firms with a large install base, you know, you take trains, the, the, the data suggests that for every new bit of rolling stock that's sold, there are 22 in operation. Well, if those last 30 or 40 years, you're missing a massive market if you don't pay attention to the, um, uh, to the, the trains that are in uh, um, rolling uh, that are already out there. So there are some economic reasons, sometimes there are strategic reasons, so sometimes your customer demands it. Um, you know, in BAE Systems case, customer pull is a big issue and they've got effectively one customer per country for those countries that they operate in, so the customer has a lot of power. 
Um, that was also true in Gear's case. So in Gear, the big uh, manufacturers of food are, have a lot of power, and so they were kind of pulling gear and saying, we would like you to guarantee availability and uptime of equipment. Um, in other cases, it, the strategic reason might be to lock out competition. So one of the reasons uh, Rolls-Royce got into power by the hour or total care was that um, actually as the install base grows and the more and more aero engines out there, it becomes more and more appealing for your American airlines. America has got a big uh, fleet of planes. You start to have the conversation, should we insource repair of engines? And so uh, actually Rolls set up a joint venture with American called Tazel to do the uh, maintenance of engines, so effectively their support contract. Uh, and the advantage of the joint venture was it, it locks somebody else out of coming into that market. In fact, Tazel will, will also provide services to United and Delta, so to some of American's um, traditional competitors. And then the environmental rationale, so economic, strategic, environmental. Environmental, in some cases, people, I think, are experimenting with service business models to change um, the, the questions of ownership. So if you think about shared cars, you know, we've all got, lots of people have their own car. It sits in your garage half the time. My car's in the car park at work today, so I used it for 30 minutes to come in this morning. I'll use it for 30 minutes to go home tonight. It's an incredibly inefficient use of a resource, whereas if we shared cars, uh, somebody else could be using the car while I'm not using it, and you would get a much better utilization of some of the assets that we've got. So some people are experimenting with that model as well. So I think there are lots of reasons, and it's rare, it's rare that it's just one. I mean, often, often there's a combination of reasons for getting into services. Great, thank you. Thank you for that, that answer. So we, we, we have another um, question here around kind of the, the Internet of Things, connected devices, obviously a huge buzzword yeah. at the moment. Um, I wonder if you could touch, touch on that and what impacts you think that, that's going to have in the future if companies are at risk of um, falling behind yeah. and they don't adopt. Yeah, sure. So, so I think this is a, I mean, I think, so you, you've raised the, the question here about this um, impact of technology, and particularly IoT, connected devices. The, the, it's, it's playing a massive role, it seems to me. I mean, I, I think it's a really, personally, I think it's a really exciting time to be involved in manufacturing. So actually at Cambridge, I'm head of something called the Institute for Manufacturing. So the, the Cambridge Service Alliance is one of the research groups in a, a larger um, uh, part of engineering department here uh, called IFM. And um, it's a really fascinating time to be involved in manufacturing. Partly because if you go back, I would say 10, 15 years, there was a lot of buzz around lean and uh, making processes more efficient, business process re-engineering, total quality, all those sorts of things. It strikes me that for quite a lot of the last few years, it's been kind of more of the same. Um, and in the last three, four years, uh, the whole interest in Internet of Things uh, connected devices has just been shooting up the agenda. So if you look at what is going on with Industry 4.0 in Germany or uh, the industrial Internet in the U.S. or um, um, uh, the, um, some of the work in um, China around the web and so on, there's, there's enormous opportunity, it seems to me, for quite a big change in the way that not just factories work, but entire uh, ecosystems work. So the, the data that's coming back off products that allows you to do different things, GPS location of the product, which allows you to see where things are. And at a, a sort of systems level almost, you can see the way the world can become more seamless and more integrated. There's, there's enormous uh, challenges in doing that. There's all sorts of issues about quality of data. There's all sorts of issues about uh, legacy infrastructure, you know, Caterpillar, as it releases new machines today, the machines they release today have got very different sensors and technologies on to the ones that they released 30 years ago, and yet today's machine might go and work in a quarry with a machine that's 30 years old. So how do you, how do you cope with those things? They're often mixed fleets. So in a quarry, you'll have Volvo and Caterpillar and Komatsu equipment. If CAT's only got access to the CAT data and not the Volvo and Komatsu equipment, how do you really optimize production of the quarry uh, there? So I think there's enormous challenges in making the sort of vision of the Internet of Things uh, deliver. I think lots of people are getting very excited by it and chasing the technology uh, part at the moment. The technology for me is just an enabling um, technology. 
the way that the Internet of Things really delivers value is as you innovate the business models towards the outcome and you start saying, actually, how do I design a business that delivers more value to my customer, that really delivers the outcomes that they want? And as you unpack that, I think that's when you start to unlock the value. And so will people fall behind if they don't um, uh, start to adopt these business models? I think yes is the answer. Uh, will some people struggle to adopt these business models? Absolutely. Uh, and will it require uh, some headaches and heartache on the way? Again, absolutely, because it's quite a profound transformation that potentially could happen in uh, industry over the next 10, 15, 20 years uh, around the whole IoT. Great. Thank you. Thank you for that. I hope that answered, uh, answered the question. So, so you mentioned then about sort of timeline, next 10 to 20 years. Um, I'd be interested to know from, from your experience of working with some of the companies you mentioned, how long did this process take? Um, because I saw a presentation from uh, the former CEO of MAN UK, I think you know, you know uh, Des Evans, um, and he's often quoted as saying it took him 10 years to become an overnight success. So <laughs> for some of the companies yeah. you, you've worked with, um, how long has this civilization approach you know, taken them? And um, if you give some insight to that. Yeah, so it, so I think I mean Des is quite absolutely right. So I, I, I think there's I think there's two parts to this. I think one, the you shouldn't underestimate the cultural and mindset shift that needs to take place. To 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 particularly if you come from a strong heritage of product and technology, and that, and that still matters. You know, if you're making airplanes, the product and the technology does matter. It's fantastic. But you, but you also need to get the mindset around customers, and that that cultural change is a, is a big issue. Um, I think the other piece, though, is it's, it's it's constantly it's constantly evolving. So there's a lovely picture. I'm not talking about it today, but there's a lovely picture of the service staircase, and the service staircase says, well, if you imagine just providing products initially, and then you say, well, now we'll start to provide products and spare parts. Lots of people have got to do that when they first launch a product. Then you say, well, now we'll start to guarantee the availability of the spare parts um, so that you, you know, we'll manage your inventory of spare parts for you. Then the next step up the staircase might be, well, we'll guarantee availability of the equipment. So we'll guarantee that your machine is up 99.7% of the time. So rather than just the parts, we'll make sure the machine's working. And then the next step up the staircase might be the, the outcome-based contract where you say, well, actually, you're not interested in the machine being available 99.7% of the time. You're interested in being able to produce a widget for 2.6 pence. So we will guarantee to produce widgets for you for 2.6 pence. So you gradually kind of walk up this service staircase. And I think what people like Man Trucks and others have done is exactly that. They, they, they've gradually climbed a the service staircase, and in doing so, you're constantly investing in slightly different technologies, different capabilities, you're building slightly different people skills, and you are moving ever closer to becoming part of your customer's business, a kind of integral part of your customer's business, but you're also taking on often more risk as you do that. And so, inevitably, that's, a, that's, a, that's an evolutionary process for people, and I think that will continue. I don't, I don't think... You know, if you look at man trucks in 10 years' time, I don't think they'll be the same overnight success then as they are today, because they will have evolved their service business model some more. Okay, thank, thank you for that, that answer. Um, so those are all the questions we, we've had in. Um, so I think we can we'll wrap things up there. So thank you, uh, thank you again for, for joining today. Um, as I mentioned at the start, the session has been recorded, so we'll send that out along with the slides in the next two to three days. Uh, we had a question in earlier as well that um, somebody had, had missed the recordings of the previous sessions within the series, so I'll send a, a follow-up email with, with um, all the recordings for the previous sessions. Um, this is the final session in, in the series, as I mentioned earlier, but we will be returning after the summer with some uh, new guest speakers, so please keep a look out for the invites. Uh, I'd like to thank Andy again for his session today. I think we'd all agree some um, really fascinating insights in the presentation today. Uh, and thank you all again for, for joining. Thank you, Andy. No problem at all. Yeah, thank you. It's been a pleasure.